is a presentation of HBO Sports. Tonight on World Championship Boxing. A classic illustration of youth versus experience between two fighters who've bounced back from adversity. Hey, hey. Amir Khan, the precocious talent from Bolton, England, with hands among the fastest in boxing. Good stiff jab, doubles up with the left hand. Khan steps in with power. Hey. At 24 years old, he's already seen the highs and lows of the sport, from suffering his first brutal knockout loss to coming back and winning a world title. I learned so much off that defeat. You know, it's only made me a better fighter and more focused fighter. Sab Judah was also once the young, lightning fast champion, looking ahead to bigger and better things, before one right hand a decade ago derailed those plans. What Amir Khan is going through right now, I've been through. I was there, I was 21 years old, champion of the world. I had everything at my fingertips. But you know what, this is boxing, and boxing is reality. <laughs> Judah has continued to face the sports elite over and over again. Big left hand over the top by Judah. He believes he's got Mayweather hurt. And after all the wins and losses, he has built himself back to the championship level. 11 years after first capturing a title. For Khan, last year's thrilling victory over Marcus Maidana answered questions about his chin and his medal. Will he hold? He will not. He wants to fight too much hard. Tonight, Judah presents another test in the biggest fight of Khan's career. The youth is going to beat the experienced guy. We're here to take his other. I think his time's up, really. You know, I've been in bigger fights in America. I've been in bigger showdowns and bigger arenas. The only one that's going to lead that ring victorious will be Super Judah. Live from Las Vegas, Amir Khan versus Zab Judah, next. hovers above 100 degrees and inside an excited crowd is filling the Mandalay Bay Event Center for the battle between Amir Khan and Zab Judah. Hello again everybody, I'm Jim Lampley, eventually to be joined at ringside by Emmanuel Stewart and Max Kellerman. This is a one fight show only, so don't wander or waver. We'll be getting to the action very shortly. Meanwhile, let's take a look at the 140 pound weight class with Max Kellerman. Max, a year ago, we were calling it the most talented, the most loaded class in boxing. Where are we now? Well, we've gotten some clarity, so it's thinned out a little bit, gotten a little more top heavy. Still very exciting. Number one guy in the division based on his resume, Timothy Bradley. The next guy in the division is Amir Khan, based not only on his improving resume, but his obvious talent. Bradley turned down the biggest payday of his career to fight Khan tonight. Marcos Maidana is still a tremendous action fighter. Devin Alexander, you can argue, lost three of his last four. He's still in the mix, though. He got some decisions. Zab Judah, you'll see tonight against Khan. Spectacular knockout win against Babuza to win a belt. And Lucas Matisse, Fights with Judah and Alexander could have gone either way. Big puncher, a lot of heart, good chin. Indeed. This matchup between Khan and Judah is one of those matchups that appears very even going in. Both fighters have multiple skills. Both fighters have extraordinary hand speed. Both fighters have interesting, if not necessarily, top-notch trainers. Freddie Roach, who trains Khan, one of the best in the sport. Pernell Whitaker now training Judah, himself a Hall of Fame fighter. We visited both training camps. Let's take a look. What Amir Khan is going through right now, I've been through. I understand what's going through his mind. A lot of people know who Zab Judah is, but I think I've got a lot more to lose. Hi, 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 hi. He's a 24-year-old kid, and I was there. I was there. Ah. I've got a lot of ambitions in this sport. One day, become pound for pound best fighter of the world, and then move up different divisions and different weight classes and win world titles. Then I have to win this next fight. I done lost more than he can ever gain. What he got, I done lost already. 
Amir Khan and Zab Judah have a connection far deeper than this fight tonight. Both collected their first world titles at early ages, and both suffered major setbacks that magnified shortcomings in attitude and approach. Oh, look at this. This is no good. For Khan, it required a complete overhaul. For Judah, it tarnished a promising career, which haunts him still today. I'm not perfect. You know, when people see me, they might see a couple flaws. I might sway here and there, but, you know, I'm human just like anybody else. I came into the game young, you know what I mean? So I never kind of created myself. A lot of things I used to do, I don't do no more. Early in his career, Zab Judah tried to personify boxing's bad boy image. Today, that's a past best forgotten. Age plus maturity has brought renewed hope and stability. Married, father of two, a more focused and happier Zab Judah has created a new lease on professional life. But the real turning point came after Judah returned to the 140-pound weight class oh, what a shot. and changed trainers. How you feel? Before, Judah was always trained by his father, Yoel. But earlier this year, he hired an old friend, Hall of Fame boxer Purnell Sweet P. Whitaker. Hey, hey. Whitaker not only brought a winning pedigree, but reinforced a back-to-basics approach. One, two, three, four, five, seven, eight, nine, ten. One, two, three, four, five, seven, eight, nine, ten. I keep reminding him that he's, he's a good boxer and he's not a gorilla. You know, and he's a better boxer than a brawler. Ah, go, Mo! I'm um, Purnell. Just, you know, he brings in the Sweet Pea aura. Arthur McKinney watching. It is over! He's one of the best pound-for-pound uh, -pound fighters in the world, one of the best defensive fighters in the world. And, you know, and uh, he came in and uh, poured that on to Zab Judah. Show me the left hand and pause and let me see the hook. I'm a scientist, and I get my job done. That's beautiful. Now you boxing. It's a beautiful feeling when you can hit a man and he can't hit you back. <laughs> so, you know, you know what that means? You got to have some defense. What? That's it. Uh, I like it. In boxing, relationships most often are extended by success. But what if success doesn't come in the form expected? Khan did record a victory against his last opponent, but his performance was to some eyes unimpressive. Critics pointed toward a severed relationship with strength and conditioning coach Alex Ariza. Khan and Ariza had split up due to a contract dispute after the Marcos Madonna fight. It was all something that was new and it, you know, the way it happened, it was it was it was shocking more than anything. So, you know, in the camps, there were a few hiccups and a few little things um, happened and I wasn't really happy about it. And, you know, maybe Alex wasn't happy about it either. So we sat down and me, Alex and Freddie and my father, we sat down and spoke about everything. We cleared the air and now we're back working together and we put the past behind us. That's it, come on. That's it, go. It was affirmation of the adage, you never know how much you miss something until it's gone. Power, go. <laughs> Today, Khan, Roach, and Ariza are reunited, firing on all cylinders. I like it. Let it go. Alex pushes him so hard, so hard, so deep, and almost to exhaustion. You have to be able to push yourself beyond not just physical, but mental. And Mir, since day one, he's always been that kid. Even though you can see on his face, sometimes he's not liking it, he's going to push through it. It's, it's not really a workout you want to wake up to in the morning, especially when your body's half asleep and you get pushed to your other limits. It's all mental, you know, it's going to get you through a fight. It's like a 12 round fight. There you go. There is no tomorrow. There is no getting up and coming back. There is no, you know, I'll try this again next time. You know, I can suffer defeat right now. You know, for Zab G, I put in my mind every day I wake up, there is no tomorrow. One punch can change your fight, and I can, like I said, I can't afford to lose another fight. I just want to keep on winning and keep on moving up and win more titles and show who the best is. Reality will set in July 23rd. Two minutes before it's time to walk to the ring, that's when reality will set in. And then we get into the ring, and look across that ring, and that lion named Zab Super Judah standing across the ring waiting for him. He'll know then. But it'll be too late. Back live at ringside with Emmanuel Stewart, our world championship boxing expert. Emmanuel, Zab Judah's 33 years old. Most fighters at that age are pretty well set in their ways. So normally we'd say new trainer Pernell Whitaker probably can't change much about Zab. You have reason to believe it might be different with Whitaker and Judah. Yes, I do, Jim. Anytime an athlete is trained by his hero, which is the case here, he's always been a big fan of Pernell Whitaker. Even as an amateur, they used to call him the little Pernell Whitaker with a flash. 
and he boxed with him as an amateur. His father, Yoel, was very close with Pernell, which made an easy transition. So I think that alone, spiritually, is going to make a big difference. And Pernell being physically built along the same lines as Zab, both southpaws, I think it's going to work out very well for him. I think it's going to add to his uh, confidence, his spirituality, and also to his boxing skills. I think he'll be a little bit better in terms of patience in this fight. So good reason for hope for Zab Judah in the fight, but of course, the central narrative as we turn back to Max Gellerman fits around Khan and his bid to become the main man at 140 pounds in the world. It's really easy to be an Amir Khan fan. Not only is he very talented, but as the money man at 140 pounds, he's a ticket seller, he generates ratings. It could have been easy for him to avoid the toughest opposition in the world. Instead, Khan has used hit that leverage as the money man to try to force the best fighters in 140 pounds into the ring with him, including Tim Bradley, the leader of the division, who was calling Khan out, the anticipation being, well, Khan's gonna try to duck him. No, Khan was willing to do a 50-50 split with Bradley, would have been Bradley's biggest payday. Tim Bradley turned it down, most people think, because he's angling for an, eventually, an eventual Pacquiao fight. So Khan looks around for the next best guy, and he's in the ring to unify belts against Zab Judah, a fight where Khan is favored. The question is, can he do something so spectacular, Amir Khan, that even though Bradley's not in the ring with him, we believe after tonight that Khan is the number one fighter at 140 pounds. And indeed favored by four to one, which are strikingly long odds in this particular kind of fight. Let's take a look at the tail of the tape. And if you've been wondering where Khan's advantages lie, here they are. Nine years younger, three inches taller, two and a half inches longer arms measured from the armpit to the end of the fifth. They both went up 10 or 11 pounds overnight. And let's take a look at a CompuBox number which further reflects an advantage for Khan. In the era of the volume puncher and scorers who favor the volume puncher, Khan throws and lands more punches. 20 to 12, 62 to 49 on average in the fights tracked by CompuBox. Now let's go up to Michael Buffer in the ring to get the evening started. Ladies and gentlemen, your attention please. In the past 24 hours, the world of boxing lost two of its great contributors. Butch Lewis, the flamboyant legendary promoter who took the professional careers of two Olympic gold medal champions, Michael and Leon Spinks, and guided them each to be undefeated world heavyweight champion. Terry Lanny, a pioneer in the gaming and hospitality industry here in Nevada, was an important part of bringing the events known as the Super Fight to Las Vegas. He will also always be remembered for his charity and his civic responsibilities. At this time, we would like everyone to please remain silent as we toll a memorial count of 10 in their memory for Butch Lewis and for the former Chairman CEO of MGM Resorts, Terry Lanny. May they rest in peace. Thank you. Coming to the ring at this time, representing the International Boxing Federation as its 140-pound world champion, Zab Super! Judah's name is striking. His personality is engaging. 
and partially for those two reasons, he's been a star in the sport, going all the way back to his amateur days. But his stardom has always been bigger than his real accomplishments, starting with the fact that he didn't make the 1996 American Olympic team when he was heavily favored to do so. Emmanuel, it's been a long career of coming up short at his biggest moments. That is very true, and that's one of the big questions that I have and most people in boxing have. He's always came up short in the big super fights. But this one point that you mentioned earlier, most of those losses was as a welterweight. At 147. Yes. And his record at 140 and below is significantly different. In fact, the loss to Costa Zoo in the fight in which he was knocked out in the second round and went after referee Jay Nady afterward and lost his composure is his only loss at 140 pounds. And you know another big factor too, you hear the music that is being played. It's reflective of where he is today in his life from being one of this, we call it the baddest of the bad boys in boxing, almost up there with Mike Tyson. He is religious now, he's found God. And that's why this music is playing tonight. Freddie Roach, it's been a full-scale renaissance of the Khan career since the shocking upset knockout loss to Bradis Prescott three years ago. The word out of the wild card, Jim, Max Kellerman, is that Amir Khan is bulging at the seams at 140 and may soon be in the welterweight class looking for a fight with, for instance, Floyd Mayweather or the winner of Mayweather Ortiz. And if that means that his body is stressed the way it was at 135 pounds when he had to make weight, and as a result was knocked out by Bredis Prescott. He showed a much better chin after moving up to 140. Maybe that gives Zab Judah chances. Zab Judah is a big puncher and a terrific finisher. Khan won a lot of hearts with his fight of the year win over Maidana in December. It was a fight in which he had to prove that his chin could weather the Maidana storm, and he did so, but barely. Yeah, he did win that fight, and it was impressive, but if he gets in trouble in a fight with Zab Judah, Zab is a much more poised, polished fighter, precision punch, and a better finisher. Then Marcus Maidana. Yes, much more. Maidana is a puncher, but not really a balanced out college fighter. See, Khan doesn't have a bunch of losses in notable fights like Judah because he hasn't fought the same level fighter yet, partly. Do you agree that Judah is the toughest opponent of Khan's career? Yes. So do I. Let's go to Michael Buffer for the official introduction. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, from the Mandalay Bay of Las Vegas, Nevada, USA. Golden Boy Promotions and main events in association with Khan Promotions and Super Zab Promotions proudly presents the featured bout of the evening. 12 rounds of boxing, 140 pounds for the unified WBA IBF Championship of the world sponsored by Tecate Cerveza con Caracter and AT&T rethink possible with AT&T 
sanctioned by the Nevada State Athletic Commission Chairman Bill Brady, Executive Director Keith Kaiser, WBA President Gilberto Mendoza, IBF President Daryl Peoples. At ringside, the three judges scoring this bout will be Bert Clements, Robert Hoyle, and Michael Pernick, and inside the ring, in charge of the action at the bell, your referee, Vic Draculich. And now, with a welcome back to Colonel Bob and for the thousands in attendance and the millions watching around the world, ladies and gentlemen, uh, let's get ready to rumble! Fighting out of the red corner, standing with his head trainer, three-time trainer of the year, Freddie Roach, wearing green, official weight, 140 pounds. Professional record, 25 victories, including 17 knockouts with only one defeat. He's the fighting pride of Bolton, Lancashire, England, the reigning, defending WBA super lightweight Champion of the world, Amir King Kong! And fighting out of the blue corner with his head trainer, four-time world champion, Pernell Sweet Pea Whitaker, wearing black with gold. Also officially weighing 140 pounds, his professional record. 41 victories, including 28 knockouts with six defeats. Fighting and training out of Las Vegas from Brooklyn, New York. The three-time world champion, the reigning, defending IBF junior lightweight champion of the world, Zan. Super Judah! Back it up, guys. Back it up. All right, gentlemen. This is for both the IBF and the WBA Junior Welterweight titles. You received your instructions in the dressing room. Again, I want to caution you. Any punch below this point will be called low. Any punch below this point will be called low. With that said, I want you to obey my commands, protect yourselves at all times. Touch them up now, let's go to it. Both men have elite hand speed and real punching power. The odds say four to one that Amir Khan is too skilled, too young, too big, and too tough for Zab Judah. Judah's always in shape, but this looks like next level shape for him. He's gonna need it. Judah says, with all his experience, he can teach Khan a lesson. Khan says, I spar with Manny Pacquiao. What exactly is Zab going to teach me? Which one has really been to graduate school? That's what we're about to find it, out. It's going to be very interesting, too, that both guys were addicted to uh, dominant weapon was going to be their jab. You see the difference so far is the length of Khan's jab. Emmanuel, how do you expect it to go? Well, as I'm looking at it right now, I think having Pernell Whitaker in the camp has been a big factor. As far as she's mentally, which is what boxing is about like anything else. And I think as a result, you're going to see Zab Judah trying to fight a more patient fight, uh, not coming out of the box fast like he normally does. Most of his fights, including the fight with Mayweather, he was ahead after the first few rounds. I think he's going to be more patient, place his punches better. But overall, logic says that the size and the youth of Khan would prevail. Khan reaching to get but to Judah. Go. Judah backing straight up. Yeah. Judah's going straight back, but it's one thing he's still pulling out of range with Khan has not been able to reach him effectively with the jab. What Zab needs to do is to block Khan's jab and then to return the jab of his own, but he's really just getting away from the jab. There are a lot of fighters who aren't comfortable going backward. Zab Judah is not one of those guys. He's very comfortable fighting in reverse, setting up counter-punching opportunities for himself. 
And Khan is expected to be the aggressor in the fight. Some pretty precise punches in the middle of the ring just then from Khan. I think he's doing well Khan. enough with his jab in the first round. Khan is doing very well. He's fighting the perfect fight for him. Zab cannot get his rhythm yet. He's concentrating on defense, but he hasn't been able to knock anything offensive. And Khan's confidence has grown with each punch. Khan saw Kaiser and Buza hurt Judah with lead right hands. And he expects to try to use that tactical gambit to try to make his point early in the fight. But I like the way that Khan is basically operating from his jab. He's not just running in pushing punches, which he has did often in the past. Khan using his feet now. Ooh. Judah almost caught him with a left hand. Sneaky counter left. Oh, and a good right hook from Judah. And their heads crash, clash against each other, and Zab Judah is blinking hard with the right eye. We've got that southpaw versus conventional fighter matchup. You're watching to see which fighter can keep his foot outside the front foot of the other guy, and Amir Khan just stepped right on Zab Judah's front foot. And Zab has a lot of scar tissue from a lot of scars from years back, too, which you have to be very concerned if you're in this corner about those cuts opening up. As expected, Khan is more wow. active throwing punches in the first round. Hey, look. All right, listen. That's the first round. You're over it now. All right, now it's time to take the jab and stay down. Keep your chin down. Don't come up. Keep the chin down, but look. Hey, you got to watch the head buzz, man. They both came in there. Legs out for me. Nice job. Keep in the face. Right? Right hand side. You have a success with that right hand. Very good. Right? Hook your body to the right too. Keep stay in control for me, okay? Alright? Okay. See you. Very good. Here you see the head, but you yeah, come in with a collision of head, which happens often when you have a southpaw fighting or a typical right hand fighter. Totally accidental. Very fortunate that neither one of them got a cut. That sneaky right-hand counter hook might have been Judah's best punch in the entire round. But all in all, the reason Pernell Whitaker said, okay, you're over it now, is that Judah only threw 21 punches in the first round. Khan threw 51, and that made it a relatively easy round to score. But Judah looks like his vision might be impaired from that hair of head, but still it looks like there's some swelling or some marking around that right eye. Khan is a bigger, faster guy, and he's fighting with a lot of energy in him and confidence. Well, Zab Judah told us in our fighter meeting yesterday that he is sure he's never been in the ring with anybody who had faster hands. As he said, in the first four rounds, my hands were faster than Mayweather's. Everybody who's been in the wild card gym and has watched Khan work out says, Zab's about to see that for the first time in this fight because definitely Khan has faster I, hands. I haven't seen that so far tonight. I'd say their hand speed is comparable. Uh, I see the difference so far is that Khan has the longer reach and he's putting his punches together. He's and, way and more he, relaxed and aggressive. He's much more aggressive. It's just simply a game of two accurate punches. A guy who throws the most punches is probably going to end up taking advantage of and winning it. And that's, and that's what's happening in this case. Although Judah's defense, he's, he's had his moments here, and he's avoiding and blocking a lot of Khan's shots. He's doing a lot of what Pred now told him, which was to going down underneath the punches. He's doing that very effectively, but he's got to return something back. But I think that, that eye is bothering him, and that may be a big factor going down the fight. Good, quick little left hook inside by Khan. A check hook as Judah came by. Judah's always been a pot shotter, meaning he looks for openings and mistakes in his opponent's offense, and he jumps in with one hard shot, hoping to hurt his opponent. Hey, you guys have mentioned the eye. Judah's now bleeding from both the nose and the mouth. We've seen Judah's face a bloody mess in the past. <laughs> Khan forcing a right hand. Now, rips Judah with the left. Judah needs to jab a little bit. I mean, he's, he's going back. He's strictly on the defense, and he's letting a child puncher throw too many punches without returning punches back. For a guy who was seen in the past as a fast starter, Zab Judah has allowed Amir Khan to dominate the first two rounds fairly easily, simply by throwing many more punches. Judah doesn't look comfortable quite yet. Well, hard right hand by Khan. 
and a couple little body shots that Khan got in. When Emmanuel mentions Amir Khan's momentum in his career, I think you're seeing the manifestation of that here, the level of confidence he has early in this fight. And look at the size advantage. His back is considerably wider. Yes, that's Sanchez the first Fury. thing I noticed right there. And he's using that advantage, too, because he's pushing the fight, forcing his weight instead of just dancing around. He's moving forward. July 28th, tune in to Jarek Jeter 3K. A rare behind the scenes look at the Yankee captain as he approached and ultimately passed the 3,000 hit mark. And looking forward to August, catch the next real sport. Find out why American tennis, which used to be so dominant in the sport, is at perhaps its lowest point ever. All right, but first of all, I've got to get you to hit him with that jab and bring that left hand as pro. Okay, don't, 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 don't relax with him. Make sure the referee says break, okay? okay. All right, keep your hands up at all times, okay? okay? He's trying to get a second shot in there. Hey, we're doing okay. okay. Very good, okay? The uppercut's working good. The body Take shot. Did you have the body? Amir Khan in the first two rounds is connected on 24 punches by CompuBox count. Zab Judah has landed six. So the bottom line is that Amir Khan has gotten out of the gate, and Zab Judah is stuck there, trying to get himself started in the fight. <laughs> Judah's never beaten an elite opponent. The closest thing he's caught, he's beaten a lot of good fighters. But every time he stepped up to the top, the real upper echelon, he's lost unless you consider Corey Spinks an elite fighter, and I don't think he was quite. This would be a first for Judah if he could pull off the upset. Judah with a wild swing there. Looks as though he wants to try to make his punching power a factor in the fight now. Watch your hands, guys. Watch your hands. Right hand by Khan. And, and what we're also seeing, therefore, might be an indication that Khan is already an elite fighter. Well, I'm very impressed with Khan's not just the boxing, but his physical strength. He looks like a welterweight in there with a junior welterweight. He looks very physically strong, and he's fighting the perfect fight for his physical advantage as well as his hand speed. They're talking about going to 147 pounds. Some say that would be about the money, but Khan is clearly getting bigger. This is a bigger physical specimen than we saw in the ring against Maidana in December. Yes, and even though Zab is ducking and making nice moves, the physical size is really bothering him a lot. Zab mentions having Pernell Whitaker in the corner. It's like Scottie Pippen in 93, you know, scrimmaging against Michael Jordan. In fact, Amir Khan is the one sparring Manny Pacquiao all the time. He's the guy in there with Michael Jordan. And when you try to compliment Khan for having done well in sparring sessions with Pacquiao, he's very balanced on, about that. He always enough. points out, we're sparring. We're wearing 16-ounce gloves. My fight schedule isn't the same as his. It doesn't really mean anything. That's an intelligent point of view for Khan. Yes, and he's going to be very delicate, too, because you know, he's sparring with one of the great legends. And to be bad enough and then saying he has taken it, he's winning, it would not be proper. Zab is not fighting a terrible fight. He's in obviously ridiculous shape. And he has everything to fight for here. And he's being routed so far. It's turning into a, a bit of a rout. But he almost landed one of those sneaky left hands that he hides and then throws from the left side. The punch that twice caught Miguel Cotto on the chops in the first three rounds in Madison Square Garden and almost had Cotto in big trouble before Cotto was able to turn the fight back around. Khan has been close to getting caught by a couple of big Zab Judah counterpunches, but generally has been in control for all three rounds. Good right hand by Khan, and he follows up in a hurry. Nice. That's the way he worked that body, son. That's the way it is. Very nice. All right. Now, Amir, remember, don't stay in the pocket too long, okay? You saw him go with that uppercut, right? He's sure with it, right? 
If you're in the pocket, I got to get some round. I got to get to the usual guy. I got to put some punches on this man. All right? I got to put some punches on him. I got to put some punches on him. I got to have him in threes and fours. All right? Going off the jab. Give me my shot. That left hand. Bring it up. Throw it somewhere. Hit him through the body. Come on. You got it. Hey, you special. Renell Whitaker seems frustrated so far with his charge. Freddie Roach is never very different in the corner. Khan has landed 37 punches to only 10 for Judah in the first three rounds. Harold, how do you have it so far? Look at Jim. Three to nothing, 30 to 27, Amir Khan. You know, Jim, the key to this fight is Amir Khan gets off first. He gets off first each and every time. He's pushing, pushing Zab Judah back. He's landing his straight right hands, and he's keeping Zab on the defensive. By getting off first, he's dominating this fight. When he circles, he circles to the right. You know, to try to square up on Judah, which is the wrong way to go, because he's going right to Judah's strong left hand. But be as it may, Amir Khan, by landing that first punch, controlling the fight, three to nothing. He says that he's circling that way, Harold, because Judah circles the wrong way, too. Circling to his left and coming toward his strong right hand. Well, I know one thing. Zab has got to start punching because he's systematically being destroyed, broken down. He's got to let something go regardless, and that's what Purnell is excited about. He makes that little duck down move, but it's a great defensive move, but he doesn't punch from that position. He as should you, be coming back with a left upper right. because he just drops down as a defense motion. And that's but what Whitaker was yelling at him yes. to do. As you said that, Emmanuel, you saw an example of it. He ducked down very nicely, avoided a four-punch combination, did not fire anything in return. But the physical weight and strength of this man coming over his shoulders, over top of him, is going to drain him. Just like I said right there, even though he's avoiding the punches, physically it's draining him because the man is coming in, charging into his body, and, it, and he's physically not strong enough anyway as it is to me. You know, the other thing is that Khan can hit Judah from a distance that Judah cannot return fire. There's the advantage in size and height and reach. Khan is fighting an exceptionally smart fight. No hold no hold And Harold made the key point. Khan is getting off first, beginning the exchanges. Judah finds himself trying to follow up with a few body punches after Amir has done something upstairs. Judah himself had a new physical conditioning program coming in. He's working with Victor Conti, former head of the Balco Labs, who's also working with one other boxer, Monita Donaire. Conti, of course, says that his days as a steroid teacher and abuser of competitive standards are over. Good right hand by Conti. You know, you made a very good point, Max. I was just getting ready to say it when he got hit that. At a certain distance, Zab can get back, but he can't. But still, Khan can land, and he can't land at a certain distance. And he's not close to that gap. So he, he can pull back from punches, but he can't return punches because his arms are too short. Well, whatever it is that Judah has to do to change this, he has not done it yet. We've seen four rounds of pretty much the same thing. And it's all Amir Khan. Meanwhile, let's take a look at something that happened on the undercard. Our first look with the naked eye at one of the fast-rising prospects in the sport, Gary Russell Jr. He was expected to be a member of the United States Olympic team in Beijing, fell out at the last minute before the games, has gotten off to a great start in his pro career, and what a show he put on tonight. Uh, unbelievable performance. Offensive, defensive, well-placed punches, hand speed. Looks like in the next year or so he's going to be a threat for any featherweight champion. Russell is, as you can see, a southpaw out of Capitol Heights, Maryland. Very compactly built. Possibly a pair of the fastest hands in the sport. In fact, in calling the fight for rehearsal, we were comparing his hand speed to that of the king of the 126 pounders for the moment, Yuri Orcus Gamboa. And he keeps his hands up, Gary Russell Jr. As opposed to Gamboa, who likes to carry them somewhere near Cuba. <laughs> Through four rounds, Amir Khan is averaging 56 thrown, 12 landed. Zab Judah is averaging 23 thrown, 4 landed. End of story so far. Well, it looks like Zab's just hoping that one of those four does enough damage that he can go into finisher mode. But in the meantime, you know, I wouldn't say he looks finished. He's still throwing those bombs. He's still trying to execute a game plan. But, um, you know, he's losing every round and getting beaten up. 
He looks like he just hasn't found his way into the fight tactically against a bigger man, Emmanuel. And, 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 and Khan is fighting the fight perfect. At the distance where he can punch very effectively. And he's reduced Zab to primarily being a defensive fighter. How about the precision of Khan's punches, Emmanuel, from long range? He's doing everything perfect. And now Judah is once again bothered by an eye after once again apparently their heads came together. Let's go, let's go. And among Khan's many other advantages, he seems to survive the butts back. Yes, and that's amazing that Zab is the one with the ball here and Zab is the shorter fighter. But every time that they have collisions, it seems like he gets the worst of it. Zab's really trying to hit a home run with those uppercuts now. Well, he saw Maidana land some uppercuts against Khan. That was regarded as one of Khan's defensive weaknesses, susceptibility to the uppercut. But, of course, Freddie Roach watches the fights, too, and he goes to work very specifically with Khan in the gym on those things that he sees from fight to fight. I think Khan is a much improved fighter from the other fights that I've seen him. This is that his left best might have hurt Judah. Judah's a little bit wary against the ropes. Khan knows he landed the left hook well. Now goes to the right. He's busting Zab's face up. It's pretty obvious Zab can't box with him in the middle of the ring. If that was the strategy, it's time to change. Emmanuel, what does he do? Max, and just what you said, just change. He needs to fight. He's systematically being defeated and going to get stopped anyway. So he's got nothing to lose. He needs to let it all hang out. It doesn't he, look like there's a plan B. No, he's, he's letting the guys out hustle. You know, he's, he's an accurate puncher and a bigger puncher oh. than he is. But he's not punching back enough. He what he did there, under, he should do more. That's the, the punch that Fernell Whitaker wants to see him throw. And that's one of his best punches. They seemed to stop Khan for a minute there. Khan got up on his toes after he took that uppercut in the gut. Well, when he makes that little bend down to his left, he's always in perfect position to shoot that punch. Plus, that's his favorite punch anyway. Dracula is calling this a knockdown on a body shot. Khan comes to the neutral corner. Judah clearly thought he got hit low. He's not going to make it up. This is going to be a knockout victory for Amir. And Zab Judah believes that he was fouled, but he's not going to win the argument. Did he not hear the count right in his face? Because he acted as though he, he was acted surprised. as though he couldn't get up. As though like his legs were done. We're going to take a look at that soon enough and see if it was in fact low. It was close. I think it may have been right on the belt line. Whatever I, I can't see a man being in. I can't see a man being in pain for a really low blow. That's a punch that that so it hit him in the stomach that really hurt him. Because the protective cup, you're not going to be down that long. Let's take a look at the replay and see where it was. First, the right hand upstairs. Legal or illegal, Emmanuel? It's illegal, but I don't think it did that much damage. It was on the top part of the cup. I would rather have my boxer get hit there than to get hit in the stomach, because it's really does. It's, it's, it's below the belt. It's on the belt. So legally, it would be a low blow, but it, I don't think it did that type of a damage. Do you think Zab was trying to buy a penalty point? Yes. Harold Letterman, what's your call about Jim, this? Let me tell you something. The rule is a, a, a shot that hits you, you know, at the belly button or above is a legal punch. Now, I dare Emmanuel Stewart to tell me where Zam Judah's belly button is. You don't know because it's being covered by the waistband. Therefore, the shot should be legal, no doubt about it. I mean, right. and that's all there is to it. He hit him on the belly button. There is no doubt about it. They ought to change the dad blasted rule and make the rule that, you know, a low blow is a point that we see. So they ought to make the rule anything on the waistband should be a legal blow. If only you could be passionate about it, Harold. Let's go to Michael I Buffer. I agree. <laughs> Let's go to Michael Buffer for the official particulars on the knockout. Ladies and gentlemen, here at the Mandalay Bay, referee Vic Draculich counts to 10, and the end comes at 2 minutes 47 seconds of round number 5. The winner, and now the unified WBA and IBF 140-pound champion of the world from Bolton, Lancashire, England, Amir
I don't copy box numbers in a one-sided fight. Khan landing 61 of 284. Judah only landed 20 punches in the entire fight. Only threw 115, which means he was throwing at the rate of about 25 punches per round. And though Khan's connect percentage is not high, physically, he dominated the fight. Power punches. This is another game in which Judah wasn't playing. Only threw 32 power punches, threw four plus rounds. Khan was doing his job, throwing as many as he could, and landing at a decent enough percentage to get the damage done. And now Max Kellerman stands by with the winner, Amir Khan. Congratulations, Amir, on a dominant win. Um, before we get to the ending, let's start at the beginning. What was your game plan coming in? Well, the game plan was uh, we knew Zab's going to be very tricky. He's going to hope for that big backhand he has. He's a powerful fighter and he knocked a lot of fighters out. We just had to be one step ahead of him, not make mistakes and not jump in and lunge in because he was going to get the backhand going. We slowly had to take that backhand away from him by stepping to his, to his left. And that's what we did. Sorry, to his right. As soon as we took that backhand away from him, I mean, all my shots were hitting him. And I could see in the later rounds, we started to frustrate. And that's when I put the pressure on. I mean, I was not tired. I was pacing myself. And uh, I mean, it feels like I'm not, not even been in a fight. When, you're, when you were at 135, you suffered your only loss. It seems pretty obvious now it's because you were drained by the weight, considering how you've taken punches since then by punchers like Maidana and Judah. Did Judah, did you feel his power at any point, any of those right hooks that he snuck in? I know he caught me a few times with them big right hooks, but you know what, I felt okay. He caught me with one good one at the end of the round and I was cool. Freddie said, are you okay? I said, Freddie, I'm okay. Um, I felt great, I mean, I felt in great shape. And all these people out there who said Amir Khan ain't got a chin. I mean, I've been hit by the biggest punches in 140 pound division, not avoided any fighter for everyone in front of me. And I mean, I'm beating everyone. So, you know, just bring on the next challenge. You certainly are. Um, were you, how do you feel about your ability to stand in the middle of the ring with a slick guy like Zab and consistently hit his head with combinations as you were able to do? Um, you know, we, we train very hard. I want to thank Alex Ariza for getting me in the best condition I can ever be in. Freddie Roach is the doctor. I mean, like everyone says, he's so smart. He gave me a game plan where every shot I threw was hitting Zab right on the chin. I mean, I know if I put the pressure on a little bit more, I might, it might have got a little bit risky for me, but I would have knocked him out early. But um, everything we did was just brilliant. I want you to look at the replay of the end of the fight. It was called a knockout. It looked to us like may, it may have been low. Tell us about it. I mean, I can't with a right hand just before that. He went down and he was open for that right hook, right uppercut, right into the solar plexus. I mean, it was right above the belt. I mean, that was nowhere near below. And that was a great shot. But you know what? Zab's a great fighter. He's, a great, he's been a great champion. And you might not believe this, but I'm a big fan of Zab Judah. So when we was doing all the head to head and we was having the little argument, I mean, I felt kind of, you know, it upset me a little bit because I, I've been watching him since I've been growing up. Okay. You as the money man in the division, it seemed to a lot of boxing fans could pick and choose opponents where a guy like Tim Bradley would have to have all the tough fights. And as it turned out, you offered to split 50 50 the revenue of this fight with Bradley. He turned you down, maybe positioning himself for a Pacquiao fight. How do you feel right now about Timothy Bradley? I think he's scared. I mean, Tim Bradley, if he was the champion he says he is, I mean, he would have, fought, he would have faced me a long time ago. I mean, Timothy Bradley was calling me out. And as soon as I started saying, yeah, listen, I'm ready to fight. I mean, he, he pulled out, he didn't want to fight me. And I really say Zab Judah is a better fighter than Timothy Bradley in my eyes. Congratulations on another spectacular performance, Samir Khan. Thank you very much. Zab, you, you seem to start slowly, but then never really get on track. What happened? Um, yeah, um, I started getting on track uh, late in the fight right there, you know what I'm saying? I started my jab off slower. He came out, came out pretty fast, you know what I mean? And, uh, he had a weird jab at first, you know what I'm saying? But I thought I picked it up. You know, I got headbutted early in the first round. You seen head, head, the headbutt. And, uh, you know, personally, I mean, everybody in the fans around the world could watch the fight and see that. That was clearly a low blow. I mean, when the referee was over me counting, I thought he was giving me, you know, giving me time to get myself together. I mean, I, I, I can't get up if I, you know, if I don't feel it. You want, we can watch it again. Here's the, uh, here's the replay of the shot. It looked low, but maybe not as debilitating. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. As your reaction, here it is. Look at it. Self-explanatory, baby. Self-explanatory. 
jam the cup of Emma balls, and I mean, excuse me, excuse my friend. I mean, first of all, I just want to thank my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ for allowing me to come out of here safe and just allowing me, you know what I'm saying, just, uh, just be back on the stage again. Zab, one more question about it. When the referee was counting, you didn't react at all. Once he counted you out, you acted surprised. Did you hear his count? No, when he said over, I thought he was saying like, like a count, then give me a second to get up. And, re, and you know what I'm saying? You know how they give you a standing eight count, say recover, and then get up. I thought he was going to eight. Then he went to 10 and said it's over. I'm like, it's over. Look, low blow. You know, I didn't, I mean, I didn't understand that. But you know, I mean, listen, in the past, when things like this happened, I've overreacted, but this time I'll leave it up to the fans and the world and the officials to uh, take the right decisions. And uh, Zab Judah is still here. All right, Zab, thanks. Uh, one more thought about Amir Khan at this moment. The question was tonight, could Amir Khan do something that would leapfrog him ahead of Timothy Bradley because the championship of 140 pounds is really still vacant. Those two should fight to determine it. Could he do something tonight that would, that would accomplish that against an opponent not named Timothy Bradley? Did he do enough tonight? If he didn't, he won every single round from a good fighter who was in top condition. He made it look easy. Did he do it tonight? If he didn't, he came as close as someone could. And, it, and it's really on Timothy Bradley right now to get in the ring with Amir Khan, who is the hunter and Timothy Bradley, the hunt did at this moment. Jim? All right, thank you very much, Max. So we'll have a final word on what happened here between Khan uh, and Judah in just a few minutes, but we're gonna look ahead to our next big HBO pay-per-view assignment because we're excited about it. September 17, after a 16-month layoff, Floyd Mayweather's back in the ring against young Victor Ortiz, who earned this shot with his appealingly violent upset of Andre Berto in Connecticut in April. Of course, we're gonna kick it off with a 24-7 series. Let's take a look ahead. My mic on, my mic on, let me make sure my 24-7 mic on. August 27 on HBO, the Emmy Award-winning series 24-7 returns as the countdown begins to one of the most anticipated fights of 2011. The thing is this, what I gotta tell y'all. Some people are talented and some people are gifted. I'm God gifted. It's been nearly 15 months since Floyd Mayweather last appeared on center stage. Outfoxing and outboxing Shane Mosley over 12 dominant rounds. Floyd Mayweather's skill level is at this moment unique. And he stands alone. Joined once again by his uncle and trainer Roger Mayweather and by a cast of familiar faces, the 34-year-old now seeks the 42nd victory of a career that has never seen defeat. Oh, work! in his way is Victor Ortiz. No stranger to overcoming adversity thanks to hard scrabble beginnings in his native Kansas. The 24-year-old was written off by many after quitting in the ring two years ago. And Ortiz just made a decision he may live to regret. I don't think I deserve to be, you know, getting beat up like this. Only to earn redemption this past April. There's a new welterweight in town and his name is Victor Ortiz fighting like a man possessed. Surrounded by a close-knit group that includes younger brother Timo and trainer Danny Garcia, Ortiz prepares for the chance of a lifetime, September 17. One of the greatest fighters of his generation against a young, strong, dangerous foe with HBO cameras following both men every step of the way in and out of the gym. From America's heartland to sunny California to the Las Vegas Strip, 24-7 Mayweather Ortiz, a four-part series premiering August 27 on HBO. So 24-7 premieres Saturday, August 27. It will appear four times. The last time, the Friday night, the 16th of September, prior to the pay-per-view fight, which takes place at 9 o'clock Eastern, 6 o'clock Pacific, Saturday night, September 17, live from right here in Las Vegas. And now let's come back ringside with Emmanuel Stewart. Emmanuel, is that a mismatch because of Mayweather's huge edge in experience and craft, or is it an exciting matchup because Ortiz looks like a physical force at 147? I think it's an exciting matchup. In fact, I was very surprised that Floyd took the fight. He has so much to lose and not that much to gain because Ortiz is not a big name. 
but it's a new type of a fighter that he has not fought in, to me, my expectation, maybe 10 years. He's going to have to go back to having one of those toe-to-toe -to -toe type aggressive hustle fights like he used to have in amateurs because Victor Ortiz is a young, aggressive fighter. And if he fights like he fought when he fought Berto, it's a new energy that Floyd is not used to. He's been fighting names. Not that he could hold, not, you know, win those type fights, but he's going to have to dig down deep for this fight. And, and some people see it, Max Kellerman, because Ortiz is a violent, hard-punching southpaw, some people see this as a rehearsal for a Pacquiao fight. Sure, and we hope that's what it is if he beats Ortiz. Uh, Floyd was hurt with a right hand against Shane Mosley. Ortiz is a southpaw, leads with the right hand and the right hook. Floyd's had problems with southpaws. As I said, Ortiz is one, as Manuel mentions. He's a young, big, hungry, in his prime, strong welterweight. Just the kind of guy you figure Mayweather would not risk a Pacquiao fight against unless he was truly preparing himself for a Pacquiao fight. If that's the case, it's very good news. The odds, incidentally, opened in spite of all that at seven to one for Mayweather and have not moved. And I think that reflects among the betting public. You may not like Mayweather. You may not like the fact that he's as good as he is. But you better recognize it. Yeah I think there's an overwhelming sense that he's unbeatable except possibly by one potential opponent. We shall see. Meanwhile we came here tonight to Las Vegas to see if Amir Khan's blossoming star arc could grow bigger. And regardless of whatever controversy you may or may not attach to the question of whether that was a low blow that ended the fight, it ended five rounds of completely one-sided combat between Khan and the best opponent of his career. If there was any question as to whether Khan is improving, is a rocket going north right now, those questions were eliminated tonight. Wherever Amir Khan goes next, whether at 140 or 147, it's big. He's a real star. Thanks very much for being with us, and if you've missed any part of tonight's telecast, you can catch it in its entirety at the dates and times listed below. And beginning Monday, watch Khan Judah anytime, anywhere, on HBO Go, the new streaming service available on your laptop, iPad, iPhone, and Android. Register now at HBOGo.com. Mark your calendars for these upcoming shows. August 27, it's the premiere of 24-7 Mayweather Ortiz. Follow Floyd Mayweather and Victor Ortiz for four weeks as they prepare for their mega matchup after 24-7. Live boxing with an all-action fight between Marcus Maidana and Robert Guerrero. Great matchup. September 10, it's Vitaly Klitschko defending his portion of the Klitschko Championship, the heavyweight championship against the world of the world against the very tough Tomas Adamic. September 16, it's the finale of 24-7 Mayweather Ortiz, followed by a special 24-7 Overtime Live, which will come to you live from the MGM Grand in Las Vegas the evening before the fight. And of course, September 17 is the big night, Floyd Mayweather versus Victor Ortiz, live on HBO Pay-Per-View. For all this and more, go to HBO.com. Next on HBO, it's Curb Your Enthusiasm, followed by True Blood on the East Coast and Dinner for Schmucks on the West Coast. And now for our entire crew headed to dinner, I'm Jim Lampley saying so long from Las Vegas, Nevada. This has been a presentation of HBO Sports.